So just for the, those of you that are joining us, we're just giving uh, people an opportunity just to connect. Um, and, uh, and I'll start the webinar in about 30 seconds. Very good. So I'm, go I'm going to start the uh, webinar now. So I'm Tanya Ward and I'm the Chief Executive of the Children's Rights Alliance. Um, and we're really delighted to be hosting today's event with uh, UCC's Law School on the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, the reason why we wanted to organise this event um, on the anniversary of International Children's Day was to really take a fresh look at what giving further legal effect of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child would mean in Ireland. Um, we were inspired, to be honest, because uh, Ursula Kelly, Professor Ursula Kelly and Professor Laura Lundy have produced a, re a really notable piece of uh, research and a, a new book looking at incorporation of the convention in different jurisdictions, uh, what it has meant for children and young people, um, and actually what, how, how it happened. But we were also inspired because across the water in Scotland, uh, they recently incorporated the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and it has had an enormous effect in, in Scotland, certainly um, in relation to young people who played a really important role um, in making the convention law in Scotland. So the purpose of today's event really is to get an expert input from Ursula Kelly and Nora Lundy, and then to hear about the Scottish experience. Um, and then we have a panel um, uh, to respond to those inputs uh, as well. So that's the overview of uh, today's event. Um, so I first wanted to, I suppose, before I introduce Professor Kilkelly and uh, Professor Lundy, I did want to ask to mention a bit what what does incorporation mean? Because we know we've many on the webinar who mightn't understand what what it means from a legal point of view. So it is jargon, it's human rights jargon, but essentially what it means is is giving legal effect to the convention in Ireland. Ireland has what's called a legal uh, dualist system, and that means when the Irish government signs up to uh, a UN convention or an international treaty, unless it's European, they have to actually introduce uh, a domestic law to give it legal effect. Um, and why it's important to give uh, legal effect to a domestic piece of legislation uh, is because you get real rights and that they are followed by officials and government. And if those rights aren't respected, you can go to the court um, and seek different types of remedies and relief. Um, and in countries that have incorporated the convention, it has had a very significant effect on their children's rights records. So we thought at this particular point in time, the time is right to ha start having that discussion again in the Irish context. So I wanted then to introduce you to Professor uh, Laura Lundy and Professor Ursula Kelly, who will do the first expert input. Uh, and many of you will know Ursula and Laura well in, in the Irish context. Ursa's Professor of Law um, uh, with an established profile in children's rights and youth justice. Uh, she's also head of the College of Business and Law in UCC. And her own research experience covers international children's rights with additional expertise in the area of youth justice and detention. Um, and Ursa teaches international children's rights and juvenile justice on the LLM and children's rights and family law. Um, and she supervises a huge amount of LLM and PhD students. Um, but she also co-founded the uh, Child Law Clinic in UCC, um, and she has been reappointed for a second term as chairperson on the Board of Management for Oberstown uh, Children's de de Detention Campus. Um, Laura Lundy is, is co-director for the Centre of uh, Children's Rights and Professor of Children's Rights at Queen's University and also Professor of Law at UCC as well. Uh, she's joint editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Children's Rights and a qualified barrister. And she acts as an expert advisor on child participation to a whole range of stakeholders, including uh, Children's Rights Connect in Geneva, which the Children's Rights Alliance uh, is a member of, but also to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, the OSCE, the Council of Europe, um, the European Commission, UNICEF, Terre de Homme, um, Plan International and Save the Children. 
Um, so really what we have is two of the leading global experts on uh, children's rights who are in this brilliant position now to give us a really uh, um, important insight into incorporation um, and, and how we could achieve it, uh, taking the experience of, of other countries. So I wanted to pass over it then to Ursula and Laura. Laura, you're going to speak first, I think, and then I think it's 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 Ursula. Great, thank you. Well, um, I'm just when Ursula, are you getting your slides up? Whenever Ursula is going to speak to the presentation, we'll both take questions. But I thought I would start by explaining our journey here. I mean, both of us had been working separately and together within Ireland, North and South on, on incorporation of law and on implementation generally. But about a decade ago, we were asked by UNICEF UK to undertake a study, a comparative study, and that's when our comparative work began. And in that study, we looked at 12 countries. How had they been doing in getting the, the Convention on the Rights of the Child into law? And we did field work in six countries, and those countries were chosen um, largely to reflect interest in, in the United Kingdom, in the three devolved jurisdictions, and at Westminster. And that study was published as a report that had a, a lot of attention and a lot of effect. And we can see since that time um, that there has been a lot of progress. But what we said at the time, we came up with a kind of formulation about incorporation and we said that it could be direct or indirect. Direct is when you take the whole convention into law, law into, into law public statute, the way that Tanya said, and indirect can be when it's coming in through legislation. And that is the normally how it happens. It turns up in your domestic law, your education acts or your social um, welfare legislation. And then we also said it could be full or uh, partial and full is you get the whole convention in and partial is that you're getting it bit by bit. That's how we looked at it then. Um, and since then, lots of countries, including Scotland, nobody better than Scotland, and it's great that they're here today to talk about their experience, have all progressed. So a decade on, we started to think, actually, there's, there's a need for more work to capture the learning since that, since the UNICEF study. But we decided this time that we should do it differently. And what we did was, instead of us going to countries and asking them what they were doing, we went to really notable experts in individual countries, and we asked them to write an assessment of how, how they were doing. What has their country been doing to put the convention into law? What are the challenges and opportunities? What have been the successes? And what are the things that are perhaps uh, still need to be done and what's stopping that happening? So I'm gonna pass over. That's how we got to where we got. And now we have this new book, which we're very excited about. And Ursula is going to take us through some of our key findings from the book. Thanks, Laura, and, and huge thanks to the, the Children's Rights Alliance and to my own colleagues in, in the School of Law here in, in Cork for today's seminar. It's great to have this opportunity, as Laura said, building on, on the work that we've been doing around the world to try to put some shape on it from an Irish perspective. Um, you'll see the details of the book. It's published by Intercentia, and you'll see the details as a, a discount code there as well, which uh, you can take note of if you're interested in, um, in, in um, purchasing a copy of, of the book. So um, as Laura said, we, we've set out um, to, to really look at this issue from a global perspective. And, and you have to start obviously with the Convention on the, Arts, on the Rights of the Child and the recognition really that the convention uh, is an international rather than a national instrument. So uh, it, it exists and sits at international level where its, it's uh, implementation is monitored. Um, but in a country like Ireland, as Tanya said, with a dualist system, it isn't automatically part of national law, which means you can't rely on it in the courts. It doesn't bind uh, the, the um, uh, state bodies within, within Ireland, although Ireland must be accountable to the UN for how it implements the convention internationally. Um, the benefits of the convention are many, as you will all, I'm sure, appreciate a comprehensive uh, and broad and detailed set of both rights and principles with regard to children uh, and their rights throughout their life and across all areas of their lives. And specifically Article 4 of the Convention is where we, we focus and that, that is really an explicit duty on the state to take all appropriate measures, including legislative measures, to implement the rights in the Convention. And uh, separately, there's an explicit duty, quite rare in international law, uh, to raise awareness, to ensure that children have an understanding and adults have an understanding about their rights. Um, and the committee has, uh, the body has, has responsibility at international level for monitoring the implementation of the convention. And the committee has, in its uh, general comments, as they're known, set out specific recommendations as to how states should go about implementing and, and these duties. 
talking about um, the need for comprehensive legislative review in the light of the convention, um, a recommendation to give the convention legal effect at a national level to ensure its rights can be directly invoked and applied, um, that the general principles, which is Article 3, the best interest principle, uh, Article 2 and non-discrimination, Article 6 on, on the right to life and survival and development, and Article 12 on the right to a say in decision making, um, are given particular expression in national law. And, and critically, I think, you know, to, to some of the concerns around incorporation, because its standards are sometimes seen to be broad, um, and um, the, the, specifically, I think, to recognise the convention as a floor. So it is a minimum standard. States can, of course, and, and must be bound by higher standards where they are set out in national law. So, so that's the committee putting putting it up to states, really, to say this is for you to implement at a national level, and this is how we think you should go about that. Um, as Laura said, the, there are different forms of incorporation, and it can be a little bit confusing. Um, but but in, in, in short, I think going down through these different concepts, and these are the ones that we found states use around the world. Direct incorporation is where the entire convention usually is given the status of national law. Um, and, and the convention rights become part of national law. Full is where that is done with regard to the entire convention. Um, partial or sectoral is where specific um, provisions of the convention or specific um, areas of legislation are, are taken and, and given effect uh, through the convention. So, for instance, as Laura said, our law on education, our law on, on child protection, on youth justice contains certain convention principles like the best interest principle, like the right to a say in decision making. And, and that's an example of partial or, or sectoral um, incorporation. Um, it can be done also in either legislation, which is most common, uh, where, where an act of parliament uh, is, is adopted to enact the convention um, on the right to the child international law or occasionally in the constitution. Uh, so some states have adopted and given constitutional standing to children's rights specifically, a specific provisions or to the convention as a whole. And then the final element, and, and I want to draw attention to this because it's a really important um, part of what's been happening to build momentum around this issue, and that's that's the adoption of, of what's called indirect measures of incorporation. This is where, for example, um, Wales and, and Scotland both have good examples of this, where there is adopted a specific duty, for example, on parliament or on state bodies to give effect or to adhere to or comply with the convention standard. So another form of indirect incorporation might be um, a children's rights impact assessment when, when legislation is being adopted. So there are different ways in which states have, 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 taken, have taken these responsibilities and adapted them to the, the national context. So why would we even think about this beyond the need to comply with, with the Committee on the Rights of the Child's guidance? This again, drawing on the extensive research we've done around the world and the benefits that those who are in, in these countries tell us um, are real um, effects of incorporation and the incorporation process. The first is the sense of uh, creating a, an, a national uh, dynamic or, or a sense that these are rights that, that belong in a national legal system. Um, that, that the rights no longer just exist at an international level and a global treaty that somehow can be seen as, as a bit distant, but actually are part of our national legal framework. In the same way that we talk about, uh, about, about children first, about the Children Act, about the Child Care Act, about the Education Act, we would be talking about the Convention on the Rights of the Child in, in, that, in that same way. So that has real legal effect. Um, we can rely on, on those legal rights. Uh, in, in holding government to account through, through the courts, through legislative and parliamentary scrutiny, for instance. They also have practical effects. So the rights can be closer to, to be claimed in schools and in our children's everyday lives. And they have symbolic effects. So it means something that we've given that standing to the convention at a national level. The probably most significant finding and benefit is through those countries where they've had to take a parliamentary decision uh, to incorporate. Of course, not all countries do. In some countries, incorporation is automatic on, on signing up to the convention. But where there is a process, 
undertaken. The process itself is of huge value, raising awareness, generating understanding and, and building support across, across communities, across the country, across sectors um, uh, and, and interested groups and buy into the concept of children's rights, why they're important, um, why, why children and recognizing children as rights holders uh, is of value and, and, and critical to how we, how we engage with, treat and, and um, look after children and how children themselves can understand their rights and that can itself lead to, to better implementation. And clearly it improves compliance with the convention. This is what the committee uh, is telling us to do and it fits with Article 4's duty as I've outlined. Um, and equally then on a practical legal level, uh, it improves the children's experience, their access to justice and their ability to claim re remedies. And that's specifically important with regard to the concept of what's known as justiciability. So we don't just give uh, the status of national law to the Convention on Children's Rights. We make it possible for children to access remedies on the basis of the Convention. In particular, um, we allow a specific or could allow a specific um, a mechanism whereby children can claim those rights in the courts. Um, and, and again, remedies for breach uh, of convention rights that children can claim. So that those are some of the examples that states use. Uh, it also improves our domestic monitoring against the convention. Clearly, it's, a, it's, a, it's creating a national benchmark in addition to the, the international one. Um, and it improves, of course, our international reputation. And this sense actually that we see in countries around the world uh, where there have been um, a very high profile um, and sometimes systematic and systemic problems with protecting the rights of children. We see states trying to, to do something very important symbolically, legally and practically to atone for those past failures. And I think Ireland certainly falls into that category. What, what we've been trying to do with all of the body of knowledge that we've created and, and we've assembled in, in countries really all around the world and in all uh, in all continents um, is to map out what we're see, we're describing as the incorporation journey. These, these, this isn't um, a, 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 a process that, that has a beginning and an end to it. Um, in, in describing it as a as a journey, we we signify that that uh, states are at different points in the journey at different times for different reasons. Um, it's a moving feast. It's a complex and a fairly um, uh, dynamic picture, and it isn't a judgment call. Uh, it isn't to say states here are really, really good and states here are really bad, uh, because we know within states there are lots of interesting things happening at a local level, at a regional level sometimes. Um, and, um, and that's why we, for example, took the maybe surprising um, approach of including the United States in the book, even though the United States is the only country in the world not to have formally accepted or ratified at the, the convention. Nonetheless, there are interesting things happening there from a constitutional point of view than, and, and elsewhere in their, in their um, city approach to, to children's rights um, compliance that we thought would be interesting to look at. Um, so in short, when, when we look at the, the, the incorporation journey, um, what, we just, what we do is, is categorize states as falling into these different categories loosely defined. Um, the first we describe as, as a category journey, stage, stage one in the journey really, where, where states have taken no meaningful or no yet no significant measures. And I say yet because some of these states are on that journey but haven't got there yet. Um, others have stalled in their journey, and, and I think that's an interesting um, point where we where we see political opposition or political um, challenge. Um, and Australia is a really good example of that. They've, obviously, they've they've ratified the convention, taken some measures to incorporate um, specific convention provisions like like best interests of the child, but they haven't moved to um, adopting or accepting the right spaces for for those measures. And there's clearly a weak political interest in, in taking more further substantive uh, rights action. Um, we, we've, we've included China in this category as well, because even though, again, there's, there's some movement towards adoption of rights into the, the national legal framework in, in China, um, again, it is more uh, focused on the child's welfare rather than the rights of the child. 
Um, the second category then is one, I suppose, more of, of promise. Um, here we're looking at states that have begun to take action. In particular, they're looking at reviewing their laws, they're reforming those laws, they're adopting a certain uh, legal measures. Um, and, and I think here we include also um, those countries that are taking those indirect measures, like Wales, the example I gave of, of the due uh, regard measure, which was adopted in Wales a number of years ago, trying to, again to promote a level of parliamentary accountability around, uh, around children's rights, um, forcing and requiring um, the parliamentary decision makers to, to have regard to the convention when, when passing and acting laws. Um, it's, it's, it's one of promise. We see New Zealand in this category too. New Zealand has uh, taken further steps um, to incorporate specific provisions of the convention into their laws in, in a more robust way than we might say, it, for example, in, in Australia. Um, although, again, I think we see a focus on well-being here rather than rights and, and a certain, again, level of, of sort of resistance, I think, to a more fulsome um, and comprehensive rights basis to, uh, to, to the convention in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, in the third category, then we see, I think it's probably the most, the most interesting category in a way, countries like South Africa um, and, and Ireland, I would say, where, where we are seeing a level of, of significant engagement with children's rights in one way or another. Um, South Africa has obviously been, you know, we've had, we had, an, had an enormous um, um, body of, of case law through the constitutional court, drawing on their constitutional um, amendment um, or their constitutional provision for children's rights rather. Um, really interesting to see how life has been breathed into their convention um, uh, responsibilities or duties under their constitution. Um, we included Ireland in this category as well because notwithstanding I think some of, some of our um, concern about the, the, um, the, the relatively weak provision that's in the constitution under article 42a uh, it has led to um, first of all a, an important process of awareness raising and, and around children's rights and we see that in some of the new uh, decisions coming from the courts but also a, a gradual appreciation of the value and importance from a legal point of view of the best interest principle of the right of the child to say in decision making and, and clearly there's some areas where we've made very good progress in our national um, participation strategy and, and toolkit and so on. Um, so starting to see that um, and again the, the reference to the dynamic process we're starting to see the potential of giving expression to, to children's rights even where those rights are not articulated in, in comprehensive terms um, uh, and where there is not an, an, an actual incorporation of those standards, the constitution uh, instead using that indirect mechanism of requiring legislation to be adopted to give expression to those rights rather than containing those rights in the actual constitution itself. Um, and then the final category that we, we've um, identified, which is increasing in size, as Laura has indicated, is really where you have full incorporation of the convention. Um, and in some instances, that's at a constitutional level and others, it's, it's a legislative um, process. Um, and in, in those instances, we include um, uh, countries like Mexico, which is a really rich uh, legal system um, from a legislative and constitutional point of view with very strong commitment uh, to children's rights principles through lawmaking and, and judicial decision making, uh, rights that are justiciable for children can claim those rights in the courts. And then we have uh, Iceland, Norway and Sweden, again, where there have been deliberate parliamentary decisions to give um, effect in, in full to the convention at a national level. Um, and so there's really rich examples of, of the, that process and how that came about in, in the book. Um, we have also included uh, tentatively, in a way, Scotland in that category, as Tanya said, and as we'll no doubt hear from Jules and her colleagues later on, uh, very important measures to incorporate the, con the, the convention into Scottish law. Um, obviously, that journey not yet complete with the Supreme Court's decision um, with regard to the Scottish Parliament's jurisdiction around that issue, competence around that issue. You know, you'll hear more about that. Um, then I suppose to, um, to um, move, move on to the, the additional value, I suppose, of this comparative process of research 
what what does it take? What are the enablers? What are the challenges in this process? And what can we glean from the study we did in 2012, 12 countries, and the study then uh, expanded in, in uh, just published this year? Uh, we, we pointed to four broad categories. The first is this um, really clear sense that political will is absolutely essential. And, and through that process of, of generating consensus, um, we see the, the importance and the value of sustained political attention on the issue of incorporation and, uh, and a sustained public engagement. So that the importance um, of generating um, both political will and public support for incorporation. And, and they are both um, really strongly connected concepts because the political will does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, it will be generated by and informed by what we, the public, uh, want our politicians to do. So the really important message about how you how that needs to be, how support needs to be generated both publicly and politically. The second observation is to recognize that there are key influences and influencers on a process like this. Uh, undeniably, individual people play a role. Um, there have been, in, in each instance, I think that we've looked at very strong supporters that have been high profile, that have been prepared to uh, make this a campaigning issue um, and hold government to account on it institutions, particularly national human rights institutions, national children's rights institutions are vitally important, but also others who maybe um, might not be either seen to be legally aligned or who would be perhaps outside of the human rights frameworks, um, uh, unexpected or, or um, bodies that have responsibility for children um, who, who are prepared to push on and, and articulate the need for a rights-based approach. And then of course, young people, we will hear um, later more about that, but again, um, vital to have young people involved. This matters hugely to, to young people themselves and they can be powerful advocates um, for the importance of a rights basis and, and incorporation. And we see throughout all of the examples, also informed and organized coalitions really being critical. And, uh, not and in, in Ireland has plenty of, of experience of this and has done it very well in, in our main, various constitutional campaigns. Um, but we'll hear again, no doubt later about the Scottish example of not not always assuming that everyone uh, who, for example, works with and for children will support incorporation. Um, that there will be bodies, uh, constituencies, and other interests that might have um, reservations or be reluctant about it. So building those the broad based coalition and consensus is really key. And then not to, I suppose, um, be uh, too, um, I suppose be, to be the importance of being flexible, I suppose, about how incorporation comes about is really important. So many of the countries that have adopted uh, a, a full incorporation had uh, false starts, had um, gradual approaches, had uh, transitional arrangements in place, and that have led to incorporation over time. Sometimes that happens quickly, sometimes it happens slowly, but we can see the real value in building incrementally um, and gradually to um, the imperative of, of full incorporation. So the non-legal measures that, that the Committee on the Rights of the Child talks about are really critical, um, having strong children's rights institutions, having national children's strategies, um, ensuring children and young people's voices are heard, uh, having indirect measures um, like uh, parliamentary scrutiny, like impact assessments, and those indirect measures can really have a gradual and transformative effect in bringing about the consensus that's so important to towards full um, incorporation. Or so sorry, just to say you have uh, two minutes. Yeah, two minutes is perfect. Thanks, Tanya. Um, so, so just to conclude and, and, and give us some thought, thoughts to, to reflecting on, um, it's really important to say that every state has done this differently. Every state takes its own path. The form and pace differs and, and hugely uh, that, that's hugely important to recognize. There is no script for this. Um, the second, of course, is that we have a hugely valuable experience um, now of our constitutional reform process. We need to interrogate what we can learn from that process and apply it to the, 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 the imperative um, or a campaign around incorporation. What are the pitfalls and opportunities? What can we learn from that process? 
Um, generating strong political and public awareness is key, and it's great to see such an interest in today's event. That is really all part of, of this, this um, uh, the, the importance of this campaign, really, when it gets going, is to have that sense of, of, um, of awareness and, and association with an understanding of, of incorporation. Um, and, and again, a very practical tool, perhaps, um, of, of scoping the, the, the gaps and barriers to decide what is the right path towards incorporation. In many of the examples we've looked at, there were parliamentary inquiries, parliamentary reviews, um, particularly with opposition parties that came into to power later on, but, but mechanisms like that are really useful to build consensus and to, to achieve um, um, agreement on the right path towards incorporation uh, for a particular country. And we think that Ireland is, is, is ripe for a process like that to move, to move the, the conversation forward. So thanks very much. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now. Brilliant. Thanks, Ursula. And thanks, Laura. Um, uh, look, that was a great uh, overview um, and a hu it's hugely valuable research what you've managed to do um, and looking globally about the incorporation of the UN Convention. You've given us a real menu of different choices about what's possible but you've also I think inspired us about you know what, what are all the different actors and roles in society uh, people need to play to make that transformation happen and and it is always you know a, a great you really reminded me about look there's lots of stuff we've done already that's actually helping us get there um, but we obviously need, if we want to go a bit further, we obviously need to, to, to lay gra more groundwork um, and potentially build a campaign towards that. So I wanted to introduce you then, and just to say to people, we, we do have uh, 116 uh, attendees on, on the event. If you have a question, uh, if you can put it into the question and answers box and the, the speakers will get to answer it in, a, in the panel discussion, at 150. So you, you need to hang around to then to get the response. But you know, don't hold back. Do put the questions in so we can plan to get panelists uh, to respond to those questions. Um, no matter how simple, um, please please put them please put them in. So now we have a chance to hear from uh, the Scottish experience. Um, and uh, uh, and Scottish experience is obviously very close to home. Um, we've got two speakers, um, Juliet Harris, who's director of Together for the Scottish Alliance for, for Children's Rights. Um, she's going to talk about the Scottish experience of incorporation. Um, and just to introduce Juli Juliet, she has worked on uh, children's rights legislation and policy and practice for many years now, uh, the past decade. She's the vice chair of the Children's Parliament and a trustee of the Environmental Rights Centre in Scotland. And she's also a former member of the Observatory of Children's Human Rights in Scotland. Um, and she sits on numerous Scottish government advisory uh, groups, including the UNCRC Strategic Implementation Board and the Human Rights Bill Advisory Board as well. And she's a former chair of uh, the Rights of Child UK Coalition and has played an active role in a number of UN task force, including uh, the UN Committee's Day and General Discussion on Children's Rights Defenders. Um, and then we'll also have an input from Joss Kennedy, who is chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament as well, um, and uh, is a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Renfrewshire and, and North. So if you can both turn on your, your, your cameras and we'll hear from uh, Julia first, and then Josh is going to talk to us about the young people's journey to UNC uh, C Corp Corporation with many of the youth representative organizations um, on, on today's webinar as well. And I know they'll be watching very closely to see what role that they can play um, in the incorporation journey. So Juliet. Thank you, Tanya, and thank you for that introduction. It's an absolute um, pleasure to be here. Um, and it's quite funny reflecting when Tanya kind of lists my decade of experience. But one of the most formative kind of points in my children's rights career was actually when um, I'd been in my job for about two months and I met the policy officer at the Child Rights Alliance. Um, and I looked at the work that you were doing in Ireland and I looked at the strength of the alliance and I thought my ambition is to create uh, an alliance in Scotland um, that is as impressive and as effective as the alliance in Ireland. Um, so everything that we've done at Together has actually been based on copying on what you've been doing at the Child Rights Alliance in Ireland. So thank you so much for um, guiding us and inspiring us in those early days. Um, so the Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights Together is an alliance like the Child Rights Alliance in um, Ireland um, with over 470 members. And we all share a vision 
that all children and young people growing up in Scotland should have their human rights respected, protected and fulfilled. And so our membership really spreads across civil society, obviously a lot of children's organisations, large ones like UNICEF and Save the Children, and through to small after school clubs, play groups, parenting groups. Um, and really, we open, we open up our membership to anybody who shares this vision, because we think this is absolutely key to ensuring that children and young people experience their rights in every single aspect of their lives. Um, so really to achieve this, then it has been uh, over a decade of work um, to really push um, for incorporation of the UNCRC into law in Scotland. Um, and I think it's worth starting kind of back in 2012, actually. So when um, Laura and Ursula's study for UNICEF on UNCRC implementation was actually brought together, um, it was commissioned by UNICEF to try and persuade our parliament um, back in 2012 that the time was right for UNCRC incorporation in Scotland. Um, so at that time, the report was extremely helpful in terms of raising awareness of the impact of incorporation and actually what incorporation, what incorporation was. Um, at that time, so back in 2013, um, there was a bill going through Parliament, the Children and Young People Bill in Scotland, and that was when children and young people started to become aware of the power of having children's rights in law, the power of UNCRC incorporation. And so I've included some quotes in the slide here because I think it's really interesting to look at some of these quotes from children and young people. And um, the children who, um, who said this, who said, enforce children's rights instead of letting it be optional. Rights should be part of the culture of life. When they said this, these children were between the ages of nine and 12. And so actually these children are now old enough to vote. Um, they are kind of active citizens in Scotland. Um, and have been with us on this journey towards UNCRC incorporation. But I think it was a real mi milestone back in 2003, 13, sorry, when children and young people started talking about the importance of incorporation. And it made people a little bit less scared of it. It meant that people thought if children and young people understand the power of incorporation, then maybe it's not too complex. Maybe it's not a big thing for lawyers to think about. It's not too, too legal. And it's something that we should get our heads around. And we should understand um, more about how incorporation can promote a culture change in Scotland. Um, so really, 2013-2014 um, is when incorporation really came onto the agenda in Scotland. And I think, really, I could say this timeline of our incremental approach to UNCRC, UNCRC incorporation begins with our biggest failure. Because despite the reports from Laura and Ursula, despite the strong support for incorporation from children and young people across civil society, um, we didn't manage to secure UNCRC incorporation in the Children and Young People Act back in 2014. And um, there were strong views at the time expressed by ministers that children don't belong in the courts, um, that um, if children's rights become too legal if they're enforceable, then it would become about lawyers rather than about children and young people. And there really wasn't a strong view among um, parliamentarians or government officials at that point that incorporation would achieve the change that we wanted to see in Scotland. Whilst we failed to bring in UNCRC incorporation through the 2014 Act, it did for the very first time um, bring the UNCRC onto statute in Scotland. So it included requirements for Scottish ministers to think about children's rights. It included requirements on public bodies to report about children's rights. So it meant that children's rights in the UNCRC did begin to come onto the kind of policy agenda um, and the political agenda far more as a result of the 2014 Act. And so it's been a really slow um, kind of journey since then to, to get children's rights actually reflected, to get the general measures of reflected in policy. Um, but this has involved things like a public body reporting duty, which was introduced in 2017. And this meant that public bodies across Scotland had to start reporting on what they were doing to further children's rights. Since 2018, we've had an annual action plan um, from the Scottish um, Government that they present to the Scottish Parliament that sets out what they're going to do to further children and young people's rights. Um, the public bodies um, were supposed to publish their first reports in 2019, 
um, 2020, but that was delayed because of um, the um, COVID crisis. Um, but it has meant that um, public bodies have started to embed children and young people's rights into their decision making. Um, all of this, all of these general measures of implementation, all of these policy steps have meant that people have been talking about children and young people's rights and thinking about children's rights in policy. And I think that has been what has built the momentum up to the point where a uh, UNCRC incorporation bill was unanimously passed by the Scottish Parliament um, earlier this year. Um, importantly, that, that's the kind of policy steps, that's what's been happening at government. It's all about children and young people's journey. And this I know Josh will tell you more about in terms of the role of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, but like I said, children and young people in Scotland have been calling for their right to be made binding in law since at least 2013. The Scottish Youth Parliament has played such a formative role in kind of raising awareness of UNCRC incorporation through their manifesto commitment, through their Right Here, Right Now campaign, through their meetings with the Children's Parliament, with the Cabinet in Scotland, with the First Minister and with actually the First Minister. And so I really can honestly say that without children and young people really pushing for UNCRC incorporation and taking such a leading role, I don't think it would have happened in Scotland. Importantly, it's about building up a really wide, um, wide coalition of support. Um, it's gone beyond just together members, it's gone beyond children and young people. And we've had to do a lot of work in Scotland. Firstly, after um, the 2014 Act, to try to persuade political parties of the importance of UNCRC incorporation. Um, so we were successful in getting the UN, a commitment towards UNCRC incorporation into many of the opposition parties' manifestos, um, which really helped us when we were trying to support the bill through Parliament. It meant once we had government support for UNCRC incorporation, we knew that there would be really strong parliamentary um, support for UNCRC incorporation. We couldn't have done it without the support of international experts. And again, kind of the support that Ursula and Laura have offered us in terms of supporting the drafting of a bill on UNCRC incorporation that provided an example bill that we put to the Deputy First Minister of how it could happen, that has been absolutely key. The support of academics across Scotland, of research, of showing the impact of incorporation of how it links to other policy and development. Again, that has been absolutely key. Um, and of course, the support of human rights institutions. Um, the Children and Young People's Commissioner and his staff have played such a leading role in pushing for incorporation, in making the case for incorporation, and indeed working in partnership with together um, to establish our expert advisory group that did draft a, a, an example bill of what incorporation could look like in Scotland. Um, so we got to this point in 2021 where the bill was in Parliament um, and children and young people continue to play such a leading role in supporting the passage of the bill through the Scottish Parliament. So I've included some um, quotes here from children and young people in the evidence that they gave to the parliamentarians as to why rights should be made binding in law. And I've accompanied this with a picture which is actually from a series of seminars that we held back in 2017. Um, and I think this picture is absolutely key to why incorporation is important. Because when we spoke to children and young people in 2017, they told us that they knew that they had rights. Um, they were taught what their rights were, but they didn't experience them in their everyday lives. They wanted their rights to be brought into reach. And they thought that if their rights were binding rather than just guiding, this would be a way of bringing their rights into reach. So they drew this for us of standing on their sh each other's shoulders, bouncing up into the sky, standing on cranes. That's how they Julia, just say you've got two minutes, Julia. Just say two minutes. Fab, thank you, Tanya. So yeah, they said that they had rights, but they wanted to bring them into reach, and they saw that UNCRC incorporation was the way that that to happen. I've got a slide missing from, um, from my slides. I'm sorry about that. So I wanted to just take you through a few details of what's actually in the UNCRC incorporation bill. And um, in our bill, then it takes a carrot and a stick approach. And so it's not just about making sure children and young people have remedy and redress if their rights are breached. 
but the UNCRC incorporation bill also includes the carrot. And so this includes things like more reporting from Parliament about involving children and young people in decision making to try to make sure that every step possible is made to ensure that children's rights aren't breached in the first place. Um, and I'll make sure that in the slides that get circulated after this event, I include that slide so you can see the different aspects of the UNCRC incorporation bill and how it does everything possible to prevent breaches of children's rights and provide them with remedy and redress if their rights are breached. Um, so to finish off, I've just got a few resources again that will get um, circulated to you after this event that um, you can look at in terms of um, some of the work we're doing to make children's rights real in Scotland. And I'm really looking forward to answering questions and discussions later on. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank, thanks so much, Juliet. Um, and I know it'll be uh, colleagues will be delighted to hear that one, one meeting helped <laughs> inspire the formation of uh, an alliance in, in, in Scotland. Um, look, there's a huge amount in your presentation, but what really stood out to me was the fact that you managed to achieve pol political support for um, incorporation. Um, and that's, you know, the question I'd love to ask with Ireland, could we could we achieve that um, as well? There might be one or two members that we mightn't be able to bring along with us. And I'm sure people listening will work out who that would be. Um, but the other thing that really shines through is the role children and young people played and how important their involvement and it wouldn't have happened without them. So um, it's great that we have Joss Kennedy, who was one of the leaders of the children and youth movement, who helped make this happen in the Scottish experience. And I know Josh has many youth leaders on the call. There's lots of young people as well listening in and they'll be really listening to what you have to say today um, and taking lots of notes. And no doubt you'll hear from them after today's event um, when they start to put their ideas together for how we can actually promote the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So thanks so much for uh, joining us here today on, on the panel. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, as you say, my name's Josh. Uh, I'm the chair of the Scottish Youth Parliament and I am a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Renfrewshire North and West, uh, just outside of Glasgow on the West Coast. Um, I've been lucky enough to lead the organisation for the last 12 months, but I have been involved now uh, for the last four and a half years. Uh, so when I was 15, um, so I was quite young, uh, right and chipper. Um, I um, started my journey as an MSYP actually on the year that SYP um, more so got involved uh, with our campaign, uh, which Jules uh, briefly spoke about, and I'll be discussing a bit later on today, right here, right now. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of my own personal experiences uh, as part of it. Uh, next slide, please. So before I start, I would like to just give a brief overview of what the Scottish Youth Parliament is for those who don't know. Um, the Scottish Youth Parliament is the democratically elected voice of Scotland's young people. Um, we were established on the 30th of June, 1999. And if you go to any um, event where an MSYP is presenting, we will let you know that that does make us one day older than the Scottish Parliament, uh, making us the elder parliament of the two. Elections are held every two years in which young people across Scotland can stand to be MSYPs. They're actually ongoing right now. So young people all over from Orkney to Dumfries are going to elect our new representatives. We're made up of 166 democratically elected members or MSYPs who represent all of 30, all 32 of Scotland's local authorities and also 11 national voluntary organisations who represent various communities, including those often seldom heard, like visually impaired young people and LGBTQ plus young people, which gives us a unique democratic mandate to represent the views of young people aged 12 to 25 across Scotland from a diverse cross-section of backgrounds and communities. We are a fundamentally rights-based rights -based organisation and our mission and vision and values are grounded in the UNCRC. Um, in particular, our purpose embodies Article 12, which is of course that young people should have the right to express their views freely in matters that affect them. As a completely youth-led organisation, including our boards, policy leads and even events planning, the words and sentiments of Article 12 have a profound importance for our work. Our values, democracy, rights, inclusion, and, and political impartiality. SYP exists to provide a national platform for young people to discuss the issues that are important to them and to campaign to affect the changes that they wish to see in their communities. Next slide, please. So over the past couple of decades, 
SYPs continued to grow and influence and has seen many of the changes young people have been calling for and realised. Whilst many of these changes came about from combined pressure from a wide range of organisations and stakeholders, MSYPs certainly held a key role in securing a wide range of commitments from decision makers. One of our most successful, of course, is seen in relation to children's rights. Our national sitting back in June of 2017, after consulting with over 5,000 young people, MSYP selected young people's rights as the theme of our national campaign. Whilst this official campaign is over, its legacy is very much living on, with children and young people's rights still being the central focus of our work. The Right Here, Right Now campaign, as it was called, was designed for and by young people, and its key messages were simple. One, Scotland's young people were to be aware of and understand their own rights, and be empowered to take action to defend their own rights and those of others. Two, Scotland's decision makers eh, to take a human rights-based approach to all policy making, service position and planning, ensuring that young people's voices are at the heart of decisions which affect them. The campaign did have many great successes, which is obvious by the incorporation which will be soon coming into place. But we couldn't have done it without the invaluable input from our partner organisations, um, especially together, um, and Jules, who is at the helm with that, have been invaluable throughout the whole process. After being selected and designed by our members, all 166 members uh, of the New Youth Parliament received interactive training, empowering training on the UNCRC Human Rights Act, European Convention on Human Rights and all other treaties which are relevant, as well as being trained to deliver rights workshops across the country, which we've done so with a wide range of young people, creating a butterfly effect on human rights depends among young people. The campaign held calls for the UNCRC to be incorporated into Scots law at its heart, and I'll cover that in full shortly, but we saw many wider successes along the way. Too many to tell you about in the time we have today, but here are a few highlights. We helped convince the Scottish Government to produce a Children and Young People's Rights National Action Plan, ensuring young people's views were at the heart of it. Our rights road trip with Together and the Minister for Child Care and Early Years. Uh, we also, to prevent breaches of young people's rights in Scotland, we helped secure uh, support for new laws, ensuring universal access to free period products and equal protection, so tackling period poverty. Um, also, MSYPs took action across Rights Week in 2018 by carrying out several activities locally to raise awareness of rights, as well as who SYP and MSYPs are amongst constituents. Our campaign, Thunderclap, Clap, eh, achieved a social reach of nearly one million people talking about the incorporation and EU and CRC rights. It was a very busy period for us all, eh, as I could say the least. Eh, next slide, please. But at the heart of all this sat, of course, incorporation of the convention. We knew that young people wanted to see this change happen with over 75% of those aged 12 to 25. We consulted for our 2016 to 21 manifesto, agreeing that uh, the UNCRC should be fully incorporated into Scots law and the rights of children and young people should be pre protected and promoted. Of course, this gave us a strong basis and a strong mandate to call for this on behalf of Scotland's young people. The fact that we knew young people across the country supported this added to our credibility and to our boldness in our calls. Uh, next slide, please. So after speaking to the experts in ch the children's rights sector and deciding to make a rights space approach to decision making central to our focus, it became clear to us how important legislative protection of children's rights was. Without it, children and young people would continue to have no guarantee that their rights would be protected or have a route to recourse when these breaches occurred. The call for incorporation became central to our campaign. In all honesty, as we, we planned it, right, and planned out right here, right now, or even created our manifesto, we thought that it may be too ambitious to ask, to, to see this be realised um, at the end of a parliamentary term. But we are so grateful now, a couple of years along the line, to be standing here to be proven very much wrong. So how did MSYPs and SYP help to bring about the passing of UNCRC, the UNCRC Incorporation Bill? Well, it started off with training, upskilling and capacity building with our membership to ensure that they could advocate effectively on a complex issue that they all believed in. From there, we had the ground running with advocacy efforts, working with decision makers to get behind this change. We create a crib sheet um, MSYPs used to educate and advocate 
with MSY, MSPs and local decision makers across the country. We asked them to take a pledge to help protect children's rights, which included many committing to ensuring that the UNCRC was incorporated. Whilst we might have not had an agreement from every politician, we did receive a lot of support and believe the impact of young people themselves calling this for this to be a huge help. Yeah, next slide, please. So we did take to social media, which is an ever increasingly powerful platform, and made sure that our message was heard loud and clear with relentless passion from MSYPs. This helped to keep this on the radar, the radar of decision makers whenever let we never let a day go by without mentioning it, making it clear that this was something that young people were passionate about and wanted to see happen. As well as this grassroots action, we were able to work to make the case of incorporation clear at a strategic level, as well as working alongside the yeah, Just system. give me two minutes. No worries. Uh, to support each other towards this goal, we used our own profile and position to make the case with key members. Uh, next slide, please. So, once a year, we as a, Scot a youth parliament and alongside the children's parliament have the privilege to voice our concerns and tell our stories to top politicians at the joint cabinet meeting in which MSYP speak to the Scottish government on major issues. Since 2017, we succeeded in ensuring that the meeting continues year on year, which is a huge step forward for organisations and others alike. This is a milestone for democracy, children and young people's participation. It's not only does it allow children and young people to make direct calls to decision makers, but it also allows us to keep them accountable for the actions they've promised in previous meetings. We were able to use this opportunity to continually make the case for incorporation and show that children and young people's rights, young people, not just adults, that th this was the way forward. We do definitely believe that hearing directly from us repeatedly make it, made it hard to ignore. Uh, next slide, please. So, we didn't stop there. We were then switched, switching our focus to ensuring that incorporation was achieved in the way that young people wanted it to be. MSYPs got the chance to share their views at our incorporation discussion day, which uh, fed directly into the creation of the draft legislation. MSYPs looked at the potential provisions in a creative and understandable way to ensure that their voices were being heard. The views collected here and then were used as a new basis of advocacy to ensure that we get the best bill possible. Our presence in the UNCRC campaigning sphere was certainly recognised with MSYPs being invited to sit in the Scottish Government's Incorporation Working Group, which is considered the best model of incorporation, which for young people was full and direct. Uh, when COVID hit our members, it hit our members kept up the pressure to show why incorporation was needed to happen ASAP to protect from further breaches that the pandemic risked. Next slide, please. So just to finish off um, before, I just wanted to share about my personal experience and I know I've not got a lot of time. So I think really the crux, um, which I've sort of touched on already is that empowering young people and educating young people cannot be overstated, it cannot be overlooked. Young people can't defend their rights, they can't preach about their rights if they're not empowered to use them. So the key takeaway, if you take away anything from what I've been saying, get young people involved, co-design is so important, but make sure that young people are actively involved, they're meaningfully engaged, and it's not just a tick box exercise. That's the way we get incorporation done. Uh, next slide. So to sum up just very quickly, this is a key and watershed moment for children and young people's rights in Scotland, um, and hopefully and increasingly in other countries across the world. We can't wait for our rights to be binding and not guiding without delay, which conveniently links to our campaign name right here, right now. Of course, there's a lot of work to be done and we're continuing to do that and holding the government to account throughout this process, making sure that incorporation and rights respecting doesn't stop here. So we do hope that the experience of MSYPs has been helpful as you continue your own journey towards incorporation. If you would like to support us in our campaigning efforts, please follow us on Twitter at official SYP and check out our website or the hashtag, hashtag SYP rights. Hey, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I went over a bit. You're okay, Josh. Thank, thanks so much, Josh. And just before you go, I might give you, I just have a follow-up question because I know you can't stay uh, very long, but just thanks so much for that for that presentation. I mean, it's amazing actually what you've managed to achieve. Uh, you've been so incredibly uh, impactful. Um, and, and not just only around the incorporation, but you know, the fact that you got a rights national action plan, the fact that you got some key universal projects, as you say, uh, delivered as well. There was two questions I wanted to ask you before before you head off. And one, um, what was your experience, you know, when you met those Scottish politicians? What were they like when they met you? 
um, and when you were advocating before them. And is there any learning for people that might be listening in um, and thinking about doing this themselves? And the other thing I wanted to ask you, did, did young people go out and do, take part in kind of the radio interviews and stuff like that that might be happening around the time? Um, and what was that experience like? And is there any learning for us about that? You know, how can we empower young people if they are going to be going out into the media on, on incorporation? That's the first one. So we've, I've met with a lot, a lot of decision makers um, from across Scotland's political parties um, on incorporation. Um, I think in the early days, what we tended to find was that the action wasn't really backing up the rhetoric. Um, the decision makers were saying one thing and then they were dragging their feet. So I think it was really important that um, obviously organisations like Children's Parliament, SYP and together were really pushing that. I mean, we brought it up whenever we could, um, flooding the airway, lit waves with it. Um, I think it did take a little bit of time, but we were continually making the case for it. We just consult more. Um, I think that sort of segues into your, your second question. Um, SYP has been really good um, on supporting young people getting into media opportunities. Um, I've been lucky enough to do a few, especially around the incorporation, um, which has been really key, actually, having young people there talking about what it means, um, as long as they're empowered to do so and educated on what they're actually talking about, not just flung, flung in there. It's really important because it did raise the profile of the issue, and I think it definitely did get it more into a public discourse in Scotland, yeah. which has been obviously really beneficial. Yeah, yeah. People wanted to hear from you. They wanted to hear what you thought. Yeah, yeah great. OK, look, thanks so much for that. It was, it was really invaluable to have your input here today. And thanks so much for sharing that email address if people want to make contact with SVP and to get more direction and support. Um, and we'll just to say to everyone who's attending, we will send on the PowerPoint. So if you want to do any follow up work, that's no problem. So thanks so much, Josh, for taking part Thank today. You for having me. Thank, Thank you. So we just have our final then question and answer session. And just I just wanted to introduce, um, we have a few people that are going to join the panel. So you heard already from Ursula and Laura, um, uh, and you heard from the Scottish experience about how our independent human rights institutions are really critical uh, in, in, in the incorporation journey. Um, and we're delighted to have Dr. Niall Muldoon, who is our Ombudsman for Children, uh, taking part with us today and he'll be able to respond to some questions. Now I was appointed Ombudsman for, in February 2015 by uh, Michael D. Higgins and he was reappointed uh, this year in 2021 for a further six years um, uh, and it's a great opportunity to congratulate Niall on, on his second um, period of appointment. Um, I also want to introduce Lara Hines who's the Principal Officer with the Department of Children, um, Equality, Disability and Integration and Youth and Lara is working on children's rights policy in the department and she's special responsibility for leading Ireland response under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the ratification of the Section Optional Protocol and reform of the Guardian Al Item system and reform and review of the Child Care Act. Um, etc. So quite a lot on our plate, but we have definitely the best person on the panel to uh, take part with us today. And I also want to introduce my colleague Sersha Brady, who's the head of legal policy and public affairs with the Children's Rights Alliance since 2016. And Sersha has a really broad background working within the human rights sector, has worked in the, the UN, worked for frontline defenders, worked with FLAC and the Human Rights and Equality Commission, the Human Rights Equality Commission, and with ourselves here in the Children's Rights Alliance. So we have a great panel um, of, of speakers. Um, so I tell you my first question, and then we obviously have we've or, uh, Ursula and, and Laura um, and Julia at the panel as well. So my first question, uh, actually, I wanted to go to you, um, Laura, if that that's okay. Um, yeah. Because you're leading the the government response in this area, you have a lot on your plate. But I would be interested to get just an insight in terms of what is happening, I suppose. And there was a key recommendation to Ireland by from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child in 2016 that we should incorporate the, the Convention in Ireland. And I just wanted to hear just from the Irish government's point of view, what, what work has been done to bring us along on that journey? Thanks, uh, Tanya. And thanks for this very informative session. I must say, I found the presentations really fascinating. And I thought it was very interesting, I suppose, the point Professor Kilkelly was making about the fact that this is kind of a journey to, to get to, I suppose, uh, incorporation or to kind of achieve things along the way. Um, and I suppose we have certain achievements to to stand over at this stage in Ireland, but, you know, a way to go, I suppose, in the context of the specific issue that's been raised by the committee. Um, we have asked the Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, Professor Conor O'Mahony, to assess 
what a comprehensive audit of Irish legislation for compliance with the UNCRC would look like and what would it require. Um, and he's currently working on that and, and he's hoping to finish that by the end of the year. But he's he's examining the scope of the exercise and potential methodological approaches, including issues such as whether to approach it from a thematic way, according to thematic areas, how to potentially score existing systems to measure the extent of compliance already. Um, and I suppose we're looking at, and so that's only one step really. He's only assessing what would be involved in doing the comprehensive audit. The next step would be figuring out how can we get that piece of work done across government? So we will be considering that in the context of the formulation of the successor strategy to better outcomes, uh, brighter futures, uh, the next national children's strategy. You know, and that'll have to involve you know, a number of different government departments and it's a big piece of work, but I suppose we've taken the first step uh, yeah. to, to commence that work. Very good. And so, and, and, and you say that the next Better Outcomes for the Futures, this is a great opportunity for us to lay the groundwork for this. So that's really important for us as a sector to be to be thinking about. OK, with that, can, can I make one more point, yeah. Tanya? Sorry, just um, yeah. also, I suppose, again, I was interested to hear Professor Kilkelly's remarks about, you know, there's different ways of kind of coming at this. We are, you know, and she mentioned child rights impact assessment. So that's something we would hope to be considering, giving further consideration to next year uh, as well. That, 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 can I ask you then a follow-up question, Lara, just on, as you mentioned, child rights impact assessments, because just in the question and answers box, there is a question from Marie Therese uh, Murray, um, and she said it's a naive question, uh, but is there currently any legal requirement for uh, the Irish government to consider children's rights when making decisions at times of crisis? So um, that might be a, a question for Professor Kilkelly. I'm not a yeah. lawyer, I have to say, yeah. but I don't think so, I suppose, yeah. would be the yeah. answer. And I suppose if, if we had those child rights impact assessments, perhaps that would be the tool. Uh, it, you, you know, so it's great to hear that there's actually work actually starting to take place to look at how those mechanisms actually work in, in practice. Can I maybe go to Ursula, a follow-up question to Ursula and to uh, Laura, really? Uh, just, I suppose, on those child rights impact assessments, you did allude to, allude to them um, in your in your presentation, and I know they are being promoted by the human rights institutions within Europe as something that we should be looking to. Um, what role do you think they can play in, in, in domestically in different countries, particularly in times of emergency? And I know there's been some good examples around COVID in, in, in this area. No, I'll let you take that. Okay, got that. <laughs> thanks. Well, I know, well, I know that you, you, you can't stay very long, so you might want to make some different yeah, remarks. Yeah. I've got another launch in the, not 20 minutes. Um, they do play an incredible role, and, it, and if there's a legal requirement to have them, then there's a legal requirement to do them, and that, that's really crucial from our perspective. But even if there isn't a legal requirement to do them, we know that they can play a role because what they do, particularly in COVID, given the question, is they would have put the gaze of government on the child. And the gaze of government was not on the child in many countries, we know that. And if it had been, there would have been different policy and other responses to COVID. So I think they could play a really important role. But to answer the specific question, there isn't a domestic legal requirement in Ireland at the minute for them to say, we have to do this. But there is an international legal obligation, you know, and Ireland will be held to account in, in that, you know, they're going to have to go in front of the committee. The committee is going to ask everybody now, you know, um, what did you do in COVID and what did you do in terms of making sure children's rights were fulfilled? So there is a legal requirement, but not in our domestic law. Yeah. OK, Th thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, Laura, so I tell you, I'm going to go to one of the technical questions that came in the question and answers box. Um, and it's from uh, Nuala Mole, uh, who's listening in, and she says, how can Ireland reconcile the acceptance of the right to individual petition under the UNCRC of the, uh, the Optional Protocol 3 and the non-incorporation of the Convention um, in dom into domestic law? And she says, we in the Air Centre are currently interveners before the committee in the first case from Ireland to be taken under the Optional Protocol. And I know in the Children's Rights Alliance, we campaigned heavily <laughs> to get that optional protocol uh, ratified. Um, uh, and I, I don't know if uh, Ursula or Laura, if you wanted to um, re respond to that question. I think it's probably a question for Lara, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose the answer would be we don't see a conflict there, but I, I'm actually, I'm 
I'm involved with this case. In fact, I'm, and I'm, I, I'm aware, I suppose, of the particular circumstances of this case. So it's, but, but I suppose the, I suppose the, the position would be we wouldn't necessarily see a conflict, I suppose. Yeah, Look, I, I think, you know, I think to, 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 um, to be fair, I think the government is to be commended for ratification of, of the third optional protocol. We, we stand out internationally in that respect. And I think where the perhaps tension is, is that we, it's not, we, you know, we, we, without incorporation, um, actually government doesn't have an opportunity to squarely address the complaint a child might raise under optional protocol three properly within the national legal system because we haven't incorporated. So it, you know, in some respects, it actually would push the bar. It might put push the bar up for children. Um, there may then be remedies they have to exhaust before they go forward. But that actually is better for children than having to go to uh, to Geneva to to seek um, vindication of their rights. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that that's the tension as I, I would see it. But I do think it's important we have ratified OP three, and um, and you know, and that that should be part of a conversation about how we ensure children's rights and children's concerns and about the breaches of their rights are addressed in a timely, effective, child-centred manner. Um, and that's not something I think we've really, um, we've, we've really worked out yet. Thank, thank, thanks for that, mm -hmm. Ursula and Lara. So I want to ask, can I make yeah. just one point? I suppose one point to bear in mind is that, you know, when these come, these issues, these kinds of issues are considered by the courts, you know, the courts, do consider, you know, obviously the UNCRC, because obviously we have ratified the UNCRC, so it is an international legal obligation. So, you know, that would certainly be something, you know, in, in a given case that the individual judge would look at. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, it struck me, I, I know when we campaigned around the optional third option protocol, it was an easier win <laughs> than corporation. So it's one of those ones, you know, where it nearly slips through the radar as well when when, when things get passed by but by, by cabinet, whereas it's, it's a much bigger thing to try and get a bill, I think, through through uh, and get political support for it. I said I wanted to go to Niall um, and ask you, Niall, I mean, what are the things coming through? Obviously, there's a critical role for children's rights commissioners and human rights independent bodies. They, they clearly play a critical role and obviously the Amazon for Children was it was it was essential in uh, the ratification in the constitutional amendment around children. Um, do you see a role? Do you see at this point uh, what you might? What's your response? Do you, you see a role for the Amazon at this stage in trying to pave the way for incorporation? And the other question I want to ask you about was really around political will. I mean, you meet politicians and officials every day. Um, you're, 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 you're promoting children's rights in different fora. What do you think we need to do to try and build political will around this? Um, first of all, congratulations. This is fantastic. I, I've learned a huge amount today from, from this session, um, both in Scotland and Ireland. And I suppose, do we have a role to play? I've, I've followed this, the, the Scottish process through my connections with Bruce Adamson and, and the work he's done across there in the Children's Commissioner. And the way they've set it out, and, and Juliet set it out there very clearly, that you know it all takes stages. But probably the last four years have been real momentum in Scotland in the way it's done, and the, and the human rights uh, institutions were very important there. And I think from our point of view, we won't be found wanting if we start to move in that direction towards incorporation, because I think I, I loved Josh's Josh's saying, and again, this is this has come from from working things out over two or three years. Rights become binding, not guiding. That's the key for us. I mean, that's what we need to get to is a stage where there's no doubt that children's rights are a key to the way we live our lives and every decision we make as a, as a government and as a society is guided by children's rights. And that would I guarantee that the reactions to COVID would have been totally different if we had an incorporation of the UNCRC. Children would not have been an afterthought. Children would not have been a um, collateral damage at times in yeah. relation to some of the decisions we made. So I think certainly we'll, we'll be pushing with that. And as regards to the political will, I think, again, I, my sense is it's probably never been considered in a really strong way. Yeah. I don't think it's been put forward yet. I don't think we've had the conversations that are needed. The children's rights referendum was a whole, I think it was a slightly different thing. And again, we probably are a different society. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the fights that we had at that stage were different, but we've shown since then to have matured as a society in the way we see equality and diversity. So I think it'll be a, a different conversation now, but I think the time might be right to move on. As you say, sometimes yeah. it's just about 
the the timing and i think we are at a good time for it now to to start having this conversation and pushing the political will in that regard i don't think it would be there'll be a huge argument against it it just timing will be the will be the discussion time will be key yeah thanks thank, thanks for that niall but as you say i think i think as well what you're kind of saying is that the the experience we've just had through covid but not having these measures in place we saw how children did did suffer as, as a result so this could be a really good time to to really think about where we're going with incorporation. Um, can I ask Sersha, um, when you're listening to the Scottish experience, um, what are you taking from it as head of advocacy, uh, legal and uh, advocacy and policy in the Children's Rights Alliance? Are you asking if I've written my project plan? On <laughs> yeah, I nearly planet? am. I'm like, I nearly am. <laughs> because I think we could from this session alone. I think it's been, um, I think really what came across to me is just that building of coalition, um, yeah. building of common voices, that peace around advocacy with political parties. And I think Jules' point around, you know, um, making sure that all the opposition parties had it in their manifestos first. Yeah. and then had the commitment from the Scottish government so that when it did get to Parliament for debate, there was no opposition to it or very little. So I think that that was um, crucial. But then listening to Josh, obviously, um, and knowing the role that both the Children's Parliament and the Scottish Youth Parliament played um, in Scotland, I think that's key. You know, I think that's so important to, you know, to, to build this this campaign and I think the other thing I'm taking away is it is a slow burner it's not going to happen overnight and we know that um, and you know we've some experience of it from the constitutional referendum the amendment we yeah. know what worked what didn't we know some of the the messages that worked with the public and what didn't and then I think there's another piece for us there about managing expectations as well. You know, what can this actually do? But if you have full incorporation, you can go so much further than, you know, we've ratified an international treaty. Um, and I think one of the, the things that I'm thinking about just with this discussion is the European Convention on Human Rights and its incorporation. You know, again, that was back in 2003. I was lucky enough to be in FLAC when the first um, declaration of incompatibility was handed down in the FOI case. And that was, I think, my second week in the job in 2007. It was 2015 when the Gender Recognition Act came in and Lydia FOI finally got her birth certificate in yeah. her, um, you know, in her real gender. So I think, again, it just you know says to me that we have to be realistic around timelines yeah. but now is the time to start really yeah thank, thank, thanks for that uh Saoirse. um I, I wanted to ask a question now this is a technical question and just actually follow on i think from the ECHR piece Saoirse. um andrew has asked uh, could you comment on the difference in legislative approach in ireland on the uncrc with the european convention on human rights where we've passed the 2003 Act incorporating it and the positive obligations it places on all state bodies and the legislative requirement for judicial notice is taken of jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights. Is there a model to follow here with the UNCRC uh, incorporation? Well, maybe if I direct that to Ursula and to uh, Laura um, on that. And I mean, it, it, it really struck me um, listening to your input. And, and I, I, I say this as a follow on question. Um, I was kind of thinking from uh, interested to know from your experience what you thought from the different men menu of the ways you can incorporate it, what would work best for Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we know obviously we're obliged to have the same legal standards for our citizens at uh, North and South. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And it was part of the debate, and Jules might comment on this, was part of the debate in Scotland as well um, in relation to the uh, the Human Rights Act in, in the UK and the interaction uh, um, and um, between the two pieces of legislation or prospectively um, and the question of, of, of conflict or contradiction. So, you know, it is, a, it is an important legal issue. What I would say is that we didn't incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights, actually. We gave, we took measures in the ECHR Act to give it further effect. And so we don't have those substantive rights in our law. Um, we have some of them in our constitution, of course, and that's important, but for children, it's not enough. And, um, and so what I would say is that we can look at the measures in the ECHR Act, the ones that, that Andrew has put in the chat, um, as, as certainly um, 
a starting point and but they do fall into indirect incorporation they don't they don't represent full incorporation of the convention international law and so you know i think i think a really good starting conversation is how do you strengthen parliamentary scrutiny in particular around the convention how do you because that process itself it develops accountability it generates awareness and understanding and it really does create a level of of um of credibility uh, around children's rights language and, and the obligations of the convention among the parliamentary um, body and i think that that's so so that's the learning from the ECHR act i would also say that it's not and the evidence is that the ECHR act hasn't been particularly effective at giving that kind of national not giving national sort of status i don't mean legally i mean in general the sort of view and understanding and, and appreciation of the echr has not really come as part of that that um uh, the 2003 act while it has had the positive effects that the, some of which uh Saoirse has alluded to so that that's my sort of take i think it's related also to the powers that niles office have around yeah. parliamentary uh review and, and how how that that can be i think uh, in addition to to reviewing legislation as 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 the office does, how we can move that on to the next stage of really really embedding much more robust scrutiny of legislation into into the legislative process from a children's rights perspective. Yeah. Uh, th 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 thanks for that, Ursa. Um, I, I am actually going to use my liberty as chair uh, to ask my own question, and this is would be a typical CEO question. Um, I, I just want to suppose to ask from the Scottish experience and to ask Juliet. How much to the cost? <laughs> How much to the campaign cost? How much to the cost to work with young people? How much resources do you have to raise if you want to make this happen? Well, that's a, a question I've not I've not been asked before, um, and I think it's very difficult to actually put an exact cost onto it um, because of the number of stakeholders involved. Um, I'd say some key key points along the way um, we held a series of seminars in 2017 with Scottish University's Insight Institute. Um, these were four seminars we invited Laura and um, Ursula to, to move the debate from if Scotland can incorporate to how Scotland can incorporate. And it was quite a challenge across four seminars to do this. Um, but those seminars themselves um, cost about £16,000. But they, I, I do think that they played a massive role in the hearts and minds side of, um, of the campaign. And it was indeed, at, um, I think, the last of those seminars, the Minister for Children and Young People said no to an action plan. Um, it's like, it doesn't matter what it's called, no to an action plan. But the children and young people that were involved in those seminars carried on campaigning um, through the Scottish Youth Parliament, kept demanding an action plan so that actually nine months later, the answer was yes. Um, so I think I think that, that that expenditure on those seminars were key, and together, Scottish Alliance for Children's Rights, we're um, we're left to have core funding from the Scottish government, um, and we've had that for ten, sorry, twelve years, um, and that is um, seventy thousand pounds a year. Um, so whilst that's not a huge amount, it has provided the stability that we need, that we can supplement the income from our membership and from charitable. You can do that campaign. So I'd say that core funding for us and for another of a number of other children's organisations has been key. Yeah, that's been key. Absolutely great. Well, it's good. It's good. It's good to hear that. You know, because this is a. If you're trying to really make a campaign like this happen, you need to be thinking about the nuts and bolts and what 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 lies behind it. Um, Larry, can I ask you? I mean, what what's really inspirational from the Scottish experience is just the role of children and young people um, in in delivering cooperation. And obviously, Ireland is a leader when it comes to participation. We have um, a participation strategy and we've got some amazing work happening um, with our youth parliament, uh, Corlin and Oak. Can I ask you what I suppose has been happening around um, the implementation of the UNCRC and the role that young people are playing at the moment? Um, well, I suppose we have the reporting process coming up, as you all know. And next year, so as part of the preparations for the reporting process, we have undertaken a consultation with children and young people. And despite COVID, we were able to do consult with uh, nearly 1300 young people. Um, and so we will be launching the findings of that consultation in a report after Christmas. 
And we also launched, uh, we also commissioned a report which looks at all the consultations, significant consultations that have taken place with children and young people since the last hearing. So that will be published with that uh, consultation report. And we also will have a youth friendly version, obviously. So, um, so I suppose it, it's to capture and, and ensure that we kind of publicize the consultation work that we've done since the last hearing. And also, you know, obviously we, it was obviously a, a key part of the process to consult with children and young people on how they feel their rights are being implemented in Ireland at the moment. But obviously the way you kind of address that question dependent on depending on the age group you're not necessarily asking them if they think their rights are vindicated obviously particularly with primary school children and given obviously the breadth and comprehensiveness of the uncrc we were asking uh, children and young people you know sort of more general questions i suppose about how how their their life in ireland um you know what they like what they don't like you know what needs to change uh, but we did ask the uh, the adolescents as suppose if um you know what they felt about did they think uh children's rights were implemented in ireland or vindicated so that that will all be in the report and we'll have a big launch the minister will launch that Brilliant. after christmas so that's going to be critical obviously that's going to be the yeah. one that's really isn't it <laughs> what yeah. do young people think um, what do young people think yeah yeah, yeah, It'll yeah be called yeah. what kids think all the well, reports that's that would be the tagline okay okay great okay thanks for that um, now, can I put the, a, a question from a participant, and this is coming from uh, Don O'Leary, um, and he says, surely the prerequisite for implementation of laws, particularly in relation to justice, is that the infrastructure should be in place. So he's talking about child friendly courtrooms, solicitors, judges with specialist training outside of Dublin. Um, and we don't really have a children's court uh, where young, young people can really participate and where their privacy is protected. And how best can we pursue making child friendly courtrooms? A right in Ireland rather than it being based um, on, on geography. Okay, well, um, first of all, let me say congratulations to Dr. Don O'Leary. I think that's yeah. a, um, long overdue, well deserved. Um, the question, I mean, listen, we are again, we are so far behind on that one. Um, the number of children and families that have gone through court systems. I mean, I, I was involved in court cases as a, as a psychologist many, many years ago where I would sit through listening to you know, uh, traffic cases and uh, alcohol cases and licensing courts and then go into a very serious children's issues. It can't be allowed to go on much longer. I know that there's work going on from the Department of Justice, but I think the incorporate this is one of the reasons the incorporation would make a huge difference in that it would really put in a momentum behind that and make it um, impossible to do anything other than create a proper family court that is child centered yeah. and i think what, one of the things we've been pushing all the time is, is it's 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 a service for the children it's a service for the families it's not a court system it's a court service yeah. to our people to our citizens and we need to start seeing it that way yeah. and providing it that way and then if you start from that position then you need those citizens and those people who are receiving the service to be the ones who feed into it and start it up and set it up at the moment, in all of our systems, we create, we talk to the people who are employed in it and get them to set up the system. And it's the other way around. It's who are you serving should be the, the, the real central piece of this. And again, through whether it's the family law system or in any of these rights issues, we need to explain to the children what they're, what they're entitled to instead of what they're putting up with. And again, yeah. you know, the children's rights um, constitutional referendum started that but again what it really has done i think it's been jammed it's been log jammed because it all it did was highlight the inadequacy of this the court system for hearing the children yeah. and the training of the, the the staff who need to look after them, the, the environment yeah. all these things that we as children's rights and human rights people would understand from the start yeah. and anyone who puts their customer if you want to use that term at the center of their their business will know that the court system is is way at the other side of it it's set up for the system yeah. as opposed to the service users yeah. So, unfortunately, Don, I, I wish I could say there was a quick way of doing it, but I think once we start moving in this direction and putting the children's rights at the heart of it, then it should be much quicker. But at least we have started that conversation and those focus groups yeah. are happening with the Department of Justice and I'm looking forward to that making a difference very soon. Thank, thanks, Niall, Niall, for that. So we've got some way to go to, 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 to really adapt our court system for, for children and, and young people. Uh, but we're at the beginning of that journey. I might finish up with one, with one last question. I know Alex Cooney has asked a really important question around the general comments that's been issued by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. 
um, and she's asking if there's any evidence of countries starting to do an implementation work on that. But um, I don't know if Ursula uh, can answer that very quickly, if you're aware of anything that's happening in relation to that. And then I wanted then just to ask the panel just to finish up on this last question from Louise O'Leary. Um, and it's really about climate, the climate crisis. And obviously we're just around uh, COP26 has been, has been taking place. And she said, would the panel see the climate crisis and its implications for younger generations as perhaps even more significant context within which to advocate for incorporation from the perspective um, of children's rights? So I don't know, or so if you want to quickly answer on the. Uh, yeah, very, yeah, very, very quickly. And look, there was some discussion in, in Scotland and in other countries where they looked at incorporation about what they would do with the general comments, whether to include those as part of the framework. And there aren't very explicit examples of where that's been, where they've been in, included, partly because they were worded differently from the convention. They're not legally binding um, um, provisions and, and the terminology is, is more loose. And that, that creates some challenges, I think, around legal implementation. Um, having said that, um, you might be interested to know that in Norway, they have been found to be binding on the courts, actually. So the courts are regularly using them. And that's really one of the side effects, I'd say, of incorporating the convention and the value of incorporation of a treaty that has with it this enormous body of guidance, now 25 general comments, apart from the, the jurisprudence coming out of the committee in relation to the optional protocol, uh, where, of course, we've had had movement, um, some interesting developments around the climate uh, crisis, um, but a huge amount more to do. And I think some of the one uh, uh, certainly um, one of the other projects that I've been working on with Tan Leifard has has been around a climate justice and from a children's rights perspective. And I think um, there's a lot more to do that that incorporation could certainly address. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, Tanya. Darcia, did you want to come in on the climate justice piece? Yeah, and it's such a pity Josh is gone because he was at COP and he was tweeting away from it. Um, but, yeah, no, I think it's really important. And like as Ursula mentioned there, there was uh, there, there's been recent jurisprudence from the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, and there's been a lot of critique of it as well. So CRIN have just issued their kind of um, statement on it, at the, the Child Rights Information Network. And, you know, I suppose they were looking at the pros and cons of silver linings, the fact that the the committee saw that climate justice was an issue and that there was a role for states in it but because the uh, rights weren't uh, incorporated into domestic law they weren't enforceable in domestic law it meant that the remedy fell far short of what the the young people wanted and what they expected and i think again it's just being very clear when you're talking about legal rights whether they're enforceable or not mm -hmm. you have to manage expectations what will come yeah. if you take a case but I think climate justice is something that isn't going away. I think the young people, um, you know, you saw Greta and uh, you, but kids from all over the world, including from Ireland, you know, we saw Saoirse Exton um, tweeting who was over in Glasgow for it. And they really need to be heard at this point. You know, they, they are out there. They're making the case for us actually taking a clearer and more definitive action on climate justice. And I think we really need to take them seriously and yeah. not just have this tick box consultation yeah. piece, you know, from time to time. It needs to be ongoing and create a platform for them to do that. Thanks for that. Juliet, did you want to come in there because you were hosting COP26? Yeah, and I think, I mean, again, the work of the Children's Parliament. And the I mean, and it means Scotland, obviously, to people who are listening in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me personally. Um, yeah, the work of the Children's Parliament, the Scottish Youth Parliament, of really linking children's rights to climate justice, I think, has been, been absolutely key. Um, and I think it really does stress, as, um, as you've said, the importance of linking rights being binding. Um, seeing actual um actual tangible change in terms of government response to um the climate crisis and i would say because children and young people have been so active and so involved around this corporation and around so many other elements of life they really were listened to i think and taken seriously in Scotland. and i think that demonstrates what ursula and um, laura's report shows that you do just talking about incorporation just the discussions around children's rights helps to ensure that children are recognised as right holders who should be able to influence the world, world around them and should be able to have impact. And I think we did we did see that in, in Scotland. Right. Brilliant. Okay, brilliant. Thanks for that. Look, I'm going to finish there because we're slightly we're slightly over. Um, 
I just want to say a big thank you to colleagues in the Children's Rights Alliance, to Sersha and Emma and to Stephen for helping with organising today's event and to UCC Law School. Um, it's been such a timely event that we, we, we are, and I'm really delighted we organise it at this point in time. It's the right context to have a discussion about incorporation. Um, we've just seen very significant developments happen in relation to COVID-19 and, and, and as the Amazon has said, very serious impacts on children and, and young people. Um, I really want to thank Ursula and Laura for their amazing work and research that they've done. Um, I, I think they've given us a great tool as advocates, you know, a real menu, a real understanding of what's possible if we incorporate and how it's going to change children and young people's lives. But it's brilliant to, to, to have real data and research looking at the ways it can happen and the different roles that we all need to play um, in society as well. A big thank you to Juliet and Josh. It's brilliant to hear the roadmap from Scotland and it's it's so it's so easy it's so across the water you know it happens you know it's very inspirational to all of us who are, who are activists in, the, in this area and you, you you really have given us the work plan um uh to, to to get moving on it and a big thank you uh to Niall and to Sersha and to uh, Lara for really reflecting on um the different points today I I, I think what we're feeling is there's, there's actually real sense of a need to really give further legal effect to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child you can see that the, the government is already starting that work. It's putting the, the basic steps in place to, to make it happen. Um, and there's lots of different ways we can all play a role in, in incorporation. So um, I think what we're saying today is there's going to be a campaign. <laughs> I think hopefully there's going to be a lot of actors. Um, and, and, and I think what we're saying is the next programme for government is going to be really critical at uh, seeing the incorporation of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child happen. So thank you, everyone, for uh, taking part in today's event. Uh, and just to say, we will send on the presentations and contact details if you want to get some um, more information and data. Um, and it's great that uh, Ursula and Laura has given us um, a discount for anyone who wants to buy the book as well. So we'll send on that to people as well so you can you can follow up and get that book. So thanks, everyone, and have a good week. Thanks, Tanya. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.